Taylor talks with poet Maxine Cuman. Good afternoon. I'm Henry Taylor, your host for The Writing Life, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to have with us today Maxine Cuman, who's not only a very distinguished poet, but an old friend of mine. It's really nice to have you here. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Maxine was poetry consultant to the Library of Congress in the early 1980s. She had won the Pulitzer Prize before that for Upcountry in 1973. She's won a number of awards since, including the, fairly recently, the Aiken Taylor Award given by the Sewanee Review. And her most recent book is Selected Poems, 1960 to 1990. Uh, there are two books that have appeared since 1990. Uh, they are Looking for Luck and Connecting the Dots. And uh, I take it that they are still very much available yes. and not, mm. and therefore, in need of being selected right, from right. at this point. Um, I w wanted to start by asking you to, to say a little something about how you got started writing poems. Well, my earliest poems were written when I was about eight, and one of my brothers illustrated them. So I was a closet poet early on. Um, I wrote a lot of poems uh, in my adolescence. I stopped writing poetry in college because I, it was frowned on. I was discouraged. Uh, I went back to writing poetry of a sort. I wrote a lot of light verse early in the 50s. And then, I think it was in 56 or 7, I stumbled into a poetry workshop at the Boston Center for Adult Education, led by John Holmes, a professor at Tufts. And there I met Anne Sexton. And there we were, the two nervous little housewives from the suburbs who dared to come into the city and met in this class. And we met George Starbuck there as well. And then mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, George and John and Anne and I and Sam Albert became our own workshop. And we continued to the time of John's death. I see. How, when was that about? 1962. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Those early light verse poems, uh, it's occurred to me, uh, although you haven't collected them, um, there is in some of your work uh, a, a sense of the things that light verse writers have at their disposal, a kind of awareness of what words can do if you bang them together right. just right, uh, yeah. that, you, um, that you're able to use in your serious poems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I learned a lot writing light verse. I really did. It, it made a formalist of me, and it made me pay attention to meter and, and to the tricks of rhyme. I mean, you know, writing poetry is a game, really. It's, a, it's an indoor sport. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. uh, I wonder if we could uh, hear um, an early poem, a fairly early poem, Casablanca. Oh, yeah. This is an early. Well, everybody has seen, I, I assume, the generation that didn't see Casablanca on the big screen has seen it on the reruns on television. So everybody knows that it's a World War II poem and it's a love story. Casablanca, as years unwind, now reels unwind, gray springs out of the hair, cheeks refill and eyelids lighten, bogey, beautifully indifferent, seduces a cigarette and womankind. Ingrid in perilous rain, intensified by angle shots, is Juno, fair and fair. Where France falls and gates clang shut, she faithfully misses the final train. Now Vichy is dead and Peter Laurie less cowardly and Green Street has gone with the parrot. And I knew a boy with sandy hair could do the dialogue all blurry. Cigarette dangling, cheeks sucked hollow, hands in his jacket pockets could do the dialogue for drinks at any party. Went down with his destroyer, swallowed in the other half of that real war. The tough guy, lately dead of cancer, holds the girl, and then they kiss for the last time, and time goes west, and we come back to where we really are. I love the ending of that poem. Um, and there's another place in it that uh, catches my attention every time I look at it, and that's the place where you rhyme Peter Laurie and the dialogue all blurry. Yeah. Um, and I, every time I look at that, I think, how, do, how, how did she manage to get away with that? 
She doesn't know. <laughs> right. She doesn't know. I she think just... it works. <laughs> I think it works really wonderfully. Well, um, sometimes we're lucky, you know. Yeah. I, I've, my theory has always been that if you play, if you pay close attention and you do your poetry homework, the muse allows you these little good moments. Mm -hmm. you know, they just happen. There's another poem of yours where um, where the form seems to me to be. Um, moving in and out and asserting itself with varying degrees of intensity. It speaks right up and says, here I am, you know, and then it backs off a little bit and, and, and what's going on in the poem says, here I am, and they come together really wonderfully, I think, and that's in those tetrameter couplets of the, of the poem, Morning Swim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a challenge to write in couplets in English because you have all these Anglo-Saxon monosyllables. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have to revert to a little bit of slant and rhyme here and there. Um, this is a poem that I wrote in, in to sort of to uh, honor a time in my life when I thought I might become a professional swimmer. I had no notion I was going to end up as a poet. I wasn't really good enough. I mean, I was a distant swimmer, but I was nowhere near good enough. But anyway, morning swim. Into my empty head there come a cotton beach, a dock wherefrom I set out, oily and nude, through mist in chilly solitude. There was no line, no roof or a floor to tell the water from the air. Night fog, thick as terry cloth, closed me in its fuzzy growth. I hung my bathrobe on two pegs. I took the lake between my legs. Invaded an invader, I went overhand on that flat sky. Fish twitched beneath me, quick and tame. In their green zone, they sang my name. And in the rhythm of the swim, I hummed a two, four times slow hymn. I hummed, abide with me. The beat rose in the fine thrash of my feet, rose in the bubbles I put out, slantwise trailing through my mouth. My bones drank water. Water fell through all my doors. I was the well that fed the lake that met my sea, in which I sang, Abide with me. That's lovely. I think that's just lovely. The, um, the, the shortness of the lines is also an interesting challenge. I mean, most of the time when we think about rhyming couplets in English, we think about them as having two more syllables right. each right. than the tetrameter couplet. Right. And so the rhymes come around just that much more often. It's the influence of a lot of A. E. Houseman. I have uh, most okay. of a Shropshire yeah. lad by heart sure. and a wind-up yeah. key. And remember that old ad with a wind-up key? I, it was for a hotel, I think. Yeah, but right. Yeah. If you wind up my key, I can do most of A. E. Houseman. <laughs> yes. Well, that, you could do a lot worse, I guess. <laughs> um, you live um, on a farm, and you've lived on, you've lived on this New Hampshire farm for how long now? Well, we bought it in 63, but uh -huh. we've been there year-round since 76. Uh -huh. So it's, you know. So it's, it's really the life. It is the life, yeah. yeah. It, um, I grew up on a farm, too. And uh, it seems to me that one of the things that um, people forget about the nature of farm life is that there is um, Life and death, life and death matters arise all the time. And most of the people who live on farms uh, live longer than most of the other residents of farms. Um, yes. That, that the, the uh, lifespan of the average chicken and uh, to say nothing of the longer lived animals. Um, and I've always, I've always admired the directness with which you approach the ethical dimensions mm -hmm of that aspect of human life. And I wondered if you could touch on that a little bit. In relation to this poem, perhaps. Uh -huh. yeah. I, yeah. I had a neighbor. Uh, he's since gone on to do other things, but he was raising veal for the table. And most people who order veal in restaurants have no comprehension of, of how cruel this process is, how the vealers are taken. These are the little male calves that they have no other use for. Uh, so they're taken from their mothers after they suck the colostrum. That is, the first 24 hours they get to stay with, with the cow. Then they're put in little pens with slatted uh, floors in which they cannot lie down, turn around, or do anything but stand there. And they stand there for six to eight weeks, and they are fed only uh, cow's milk in a nippled pail. 
and they get the scours. They get terrible diarrhea because it's iron deficient. Uh, this is how you get what is called baby milk-fed veal. It's re it's an appalling practice, and it ought to be, I feel. Absolutely. I really feel it should be outlawed. I, I like to be asked to read this poem because I'm proselytizing. I figure after I read this poem, there are going to be a few people who are not going to order veal unless it's f a range, you know, free-range mm -hmm. veal. The reason they pen them up like this is to get this perfect uh, flesh that has, shows no blood or muscle. No muscle tone whatsoever. That's right, yeah. right. So this poem is called The Veelers. Now, after I wrote this poem, I had so much more to say about the subject that I wrote a short story called Buying the Child, in which a young homesteading couple, the, the young woman, purchases uh, a veeler from this farmer. And they name it New Jersey. It's a little Jersey calf. <laughs> and they keep it. And of course, it turns into a bull. And it gores the farmer's dog. And it eventually goes off to slaughter. But having written the short story, I got carried away by some other characters that came along. And it ended up being a novel called The Designated Heir, H-E-I-R. Oh, sure. Yeah. So this is the poem that turned into a novel, The Veelers. They come forth with all four legs folded in like a dime store card table. Their hides are watered silk. As in blind man's buff, they rise, unable to know except by touch, and begin to root from side to side in search of milk. The stanchions hang empty, straw beds the planks that day. On that day, they are left at will to nuzzle and malinger under the umbrella of their mother's flanks sucking from those four fingers they were called forth to fill. Immediately thereafter, each is penned narrowly and well like a Strasbourg goose. Milk comes on schedule in a nippled pail. It is never enough to set them loose from that birthday dividend of touch. Bleating racks the jail. Across the barn, the freshened cows answer until they forget who is there. Morning and night, machinery empties their udders. Grazing allows them to refill. The hungry calves bawl and doze, sucking air. The sponges of their muzzles pucker and grow wet with nursing dreams. In ten weeks' time, the knocker, the local slaughterer, will back his truck against the ramp, and prodded to extremes, they will kick and buck and enter. And in our time, they will come forth for good, dead center, wrapped and labeled in a plastic sheet, their perfect flesh unstreaked with blood or muscle, and we will eat. It occurs to me, and I don't know whether it's ever occurred to me before, to put it just this way, that, um, that sentimentality might be feeling that all feelings are comfortable. Anyway, there are lots of feelings in that poem that aren't very comfortable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah. it's a very powerful piece of work. I admire Thank it very you. much. Thank you. Um, that the fact that you write d many different kinds of things does not make you feel like correcting people who introduce you as a poet. Yeah. Because I am primarily. I mean, yeah. I was a poet first, and if, you know, if the muse came down and said, you can only be one thing, choose, I would have to choose to be a poet. Although I really like working in prose, and I think it's good for poets to write prose because it reintroduces you to the simple declarative sentence. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many ellipses available to you in, in the course of writing a poem mm -hmm. that That's right. writing prose brings you up short. You know, that, Well, I think the major difference between them is that uh, poetry is is often concerned to do as well as to say, you know, to have effects. To, to, mm -hmm. to it's it's mm -hmm. more of a thing than mm -hmm. a than a thought, and and prose is primarily trying to get something said. Wonderful that you and, said uh, thing and thought because you know Nemirov always said metaphor mediates between a thing and a thought, and oh, I yeah. always thought that's a wonderful uh -huh. definition. Yeah, what a wonderful yeah. man he was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Henry Manley. Tell, tell us a little bit about Henry Manley. I like him, of course, because I admire his name. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> well, Henry Manley is gone now, but he was our neighbor for many, many years. And I wrote a lot of Henry Manley poems. This one is, was the first, but there are probably five or six more yeah. uh, that I wrote about him. And, uh, could, you, yeah. could you read? I'd love to read this one. Um, 
It's called Hello, Hello, Henry. And, and this is based on actual incident, which doesn't, you know, has nothing to do with the worth or failure of a poem. I mean, your students That's say right. to you all the time, but it really happened this way. And then uh -huh. you have to say to them, That's life not is enough. not art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, art is something that goes beyond. Yeah. My neighbor in the country, Henry Manley, with a wash pot warming on his wood stove, with a heifer and two goats and yearly chickens, has outlasted Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, but something's stirring in him in his dotage. Last fall, he dug a hole and moved his privy, and a year ago in April, reamed the well out. When the county sent a truck and poles and cable, his daddy ran the linemen off with birdshot and swore he'd die by oil lamp and did. Now you tell me that all yesterday in Boston you set your city phone at mine and had it ringing inside a dead apartment for three hours, room after empty room to keep yours busy. I hear it in my head, that ranting summons. That must have been about the time that Henry walked up two miles, shy as a girl come calling, to tell me he has a phone now, 264, ring two. It rang one time last week, wrong number. He'd be pleased if one day I would think to call him. Hello, hello, Henry. Is that you? That's wonderful. He, um... You have other, I mean, he's a sort of a, he's a real person. You have some yeah. sort of amalgam people, too. Yeah, you know, like well, the, he's an amalgam, yeah. too. I mean, it's, he wasn't a bachelor and, you know, a lot of the things, and he didn't work for the fisheries and so on, but um, I, I have kind of, in, I've invented him, but he's based on a real mm -hmm. character. The, the, the liberating uh, availability of other people's voices mm -hmm. is something that seems... Um, important to your work, that every now and then it's, it's, it, must, it seems like a real pleasure to get out there. Yeah, and I think it is for all of us, isn't it? It is for me. Yeah, yeah I yeah. agree. Yeah. Um, when people say things the way you would never have said them, yes. and, um, and the first thing you want to do is say it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned early on, as, as we were talking about your workshop days, that um, those were the days that you became friendly with mm -hmm. Anne Sexton. And, uh, right. You've and written several poems about... I have. Uh, I think Maybe it's, the last one. I would like to think that I'm done with this. But it's been a long time. It was 1974, mm -hmm. I think. October 4th, 1974, that she took her life. And this was after we had been really intimate friends, personally and professionally, for 17 and a half years. I mean, we exchanged poems, we read poems over the phone to each other, we were very closely connected poetically. Also, we wore the same size clothes, and after her death, her daughters asked me to come over and go through her closet and take anything, you know, that I wanted. Well, it was, I couldn't do it. I mean, I took just this one object that's in this poem. I found I really couldn't take anything else. Mm -hmm. And the poem is called, How It Is. Shall I say how it is in your clothes? A month after your death, I wear your blue jacket. The dog at the center of my life recognizes you've come to visit. He's ecstatic. In the left pocket, a hole. In the right, a parking ticket delivered up last August on Bay State Road. In my heart, a scatter like milkweed, a flinging from the pods of the soul. My skin presses your old outline. It is hot and dry inside. I think of the last day of your life, old friend, how I would unwind it, paste it together in a different collage, back from the death car idling in the garage, back up the stairs, your praying hands unlaced, Reassembling the bits of bread and tuna fish into a ceremony of sandwich, running the home movie backward to a space we could be easy in, a kitchen place with vodka and ice, our words like living meat. Dear friend, you have excited crowds with your example. They swell like wine bags, straining at your seams. I will be years gathering up our words, fishing out letters, snapshots, stains, leaning my ribs against this durable cloth to put on the dumb blue blazer of your death.
there's another moment in this poem that strikes me as, as uh, high risk and, and successfully so. Um, I routinely tell my students that, um, that metaphors using prepositional phrases, the dumb blue blazer of your death, uh, yeah. are uh, extremely hard to get away with, to, to make work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it occurs to me that one of the things that makes this one work so well is, is the, the terrifying uh, evocation of things like the land of the dead that's in dumb blue blazer. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, think of, I think of, you know, Hades and Persephone <laughs> in, those, in, those, in that place. Yeah. Um, it interests me a lot that, um, that you and Anne Sexton were as close as you were for as long as you were. I mean, because we were so different. Yeah. Incredibly. Yeah. Um, I mean. Yeah, but you know, Henry, this was before the women's movement. We were two isolated women living in the same sort of sterile suburb. We both had little kids at home. We were both trying to make it as poets in an atmosphere that was not enormously hospitable to women writers. Mm -hmm. So you know, we had a there was a lot of sharing, uh, just just in those terms. Mm -hmm. And I think we were awfully careful not to sound like each other. That was the you know. I mean, we seem to be able to help the other's voice without trespassing on it. Probably it wasn't hard, that part. No. Uh -uh. As different as you, as right. you were. I mean, right. I've always thought of her as being immensely uh, drawn to sort of self-dramatization oh, of absolutely. various kinds. Oh, absolutely. She was and, enormously exhibitionist. I mean, she wanted to be a rock star and, in yeah. fact, had a rock yeah. band. Yes, she did. And, <laughs> and Sexton and yeah. her kind. And her yeah. kind, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a tape of, of, of their work. Yeah. Uh, well, my son Dan wrote the music for the little peasant. Next time you listen to that tape, of, okay, yeah, you because know, okay. it's kind of good, witty music. Well, let's move a little okay. bit closer to the end of the book. Um, All right. Uh, into your life, there have come um, <laughs> young children again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, now they are the children of your children. Right. And uh, there's a poem we stood there singing that. Um, moves me very deeply in its um, ev evocation of, of the suddenness with which a sense of community can just suddenly just mm -hmm. be there. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. you know, it was an astonishing moment, really. Let's yeah. hear about it. Yeah, OK, this is set in uh, Switzerland, actually. We are driving up into the Jura to find the, the horses that are the official horse of the Swiss Army, and they do still use them as draft horses, and they use them in the mountains too. Good heavens! Yeah, it's a light draft breed, and they're quite lovely. And this is my number two daughter, who really was responsible for my getting into horses at all. I mean, I was quite normal until she was horse crazy as a youngster, and then I was reinfected, and she got over it pretty much. But the contagion has lasted for me. So this poem is called "We Stood There Singing." On a gray day in March in his first year, we drove up out of orderly Geneva, mother and daughter and the daughter's child, up the hairpin turns of the Chasserelle in search of the horses of the Franche Montagne, with feathered fetlocks and manes blown wild, each splashed white face the same, the same kind eye said to persist unchanged since Charlemagne. The baby slept tipped sideways in his chair, slept through sudden snow squalls that blanked the alpine road like a stage scrim, and woke up cranky in Les Brûleurs, where, at the village's one store, we stopped to take our bearings. When he howled, the aproned woman invited us back past vats of sauerkraut and wheels of cheese into their bedroom. I remember that plain space of rough white plaster, oaken crucifix, oak beams overhead, runner of tatted lace on the chest of drawers. I remember the lambskin she unrolled on the bed, motioning you to lay him down. And after he was done up sweet with powder, she opened her arms and bounced him chortling around the room, singing him bits of Le Bon Roi Dagobert. We stood there singing. I remember that moment of civility among women. It's just terrific. And it's, um, it, I think it takes a long time to learn when it is exactly right to be just 
very direct and to say it as simply as you possibly can. We stood there singing. I remember that moment of civility among women. There's nothing, mm -hmm. there's nothing there that the poetry instructor is going to be right. able to fasten <laughs> on, you know? Yeah. And I think that's wonderful. I think partly, too, you have to have arrived at a certain age where you're willing to take that kind of risky, direct, frontal statement. Yeah, I guess so. I think we have time for one more, which is um, th that wonderful poem about the encounter with the bear. Um, okay, you'll have that, to pass um, me that. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think I Okay, this is the final right poem there. in Looking for Luck, and it's based on an uh, Indian legend, the Clinket Indians of the Aleutian chain of islands. It's called the Rendezvous. How narrow the bear trail through the forest, one paw print following the other, in the manner of good King Wenceslas, tagged by his faithful serf. How, according to the legend, a bear is able to feel shame, and if a woman meets a male bear, she should take off all her clothes, thereby causing him to run away. How I meet a male bear, how I am careful not to insult him, I unbutton my blouse, he takes out his teeth, I slip off my skirt. He turns his back and works his way out of his pelt, which he casts to the ground for a rug. He smells of honey and garlic. I am wet with human fear. How can he run away unfurred? How can I without my clothes? How we prepare a new legend. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's amazing. And again, has that has that very calm, straightforward directness with something um, totally. It's just taking the myth to you know to sure. a higher plane or to its logical conclusion, perhaps I should say. But don't you think that um, that being around horses as much as you are, mm. um, I mean other animals too, but horses really connect you to to the animal world very yeah. deeply. Yeah. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of popular mythologizing about uh, horses. Some of it is nonsense. Right. Um, and yet, it is based on something that really does happen. You know, um, I have, I've always said to, to students that I've taught riding that you can teach a horse to do a lot of things. And you can ask a horse to give, hi give his best. And every now and then, you ask them and they do it. <laughs> you know, you ask them for their best and they give it to you. And you cannot make them do that. That's right. You can't muscle a horse. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something magical that happens. Yeah. There's some inexplicable well, connection. Yeah, right. It's rapport and a little bit of charisma and a little bit of luck. There's a lot of luck in right. what we do. Yeah. It's been very nice having you here. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Henry. It was fun doing it with you. And thank you for joining us on The Writing Life. Thank you.